Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd So amongst some of the most important books regarding the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the aqidah of Ahl al-Sunnati wa al-Jama'ah is the book that we have before us which is called Sharr or it's called Usul al-Sunnah by Imam Ahmed by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal Rahimahullah Ta'ala one of the great Imams of the Sunnah who is known for his fadl and his, his benefit as a great Imam and is also one of the great mujtahideen in this religion you know one of the great Imams who all of the Ummah is basically united on their great benefit, especially in fiqh, in fiqh and aqidah. But especially, and if I can, if I can see your book really quickly, because there's a beautiful statement by Imam Shafi'i here. Imam Shafi'i, which will do us better justice than anything I can say, regarding Imam, uh, Imam Ahmed, Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, amongst the four Imams, there are four great Imams, the Imams of fiqh, of Islamic jurisprudence, you know, about the fiqh judgments and so forth. And first is Imam Abu Hanifa, then you have Imam Shafi'i, and you have Imam Malik, and you have Imam Ahmed. And this book right here is a book by Imam Ahmed. And basically it's a treatise of, uh, related to uh, the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, because they call Imam Ahmed one of the Imams of the Sunnah, the Imam of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. You know, so he was a great, great Imam. So Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said about Imam Ahmed, he said, I left Baghdad and I did not leave behind me a, a man better, having more knowledge or greater fiqh, nor having greater taqwa than Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So this was Imam Shafi'i, who is also a great uh, mujtahid in this religion and they call them uh, that they're mujtahid mutlaq you know that that even that they have a madhab that people follow as far as how to understand fiqh you know jurisprudence and stuff like this like the rulings pertinent to prayer the rulings pertinent to wudu the rulings pertinent to women's issues the rulings pertinent to uh, inheritance uh, marriage divorce all of these issues that these great Imams, they had madhabs. And so this is what Imam Shafi'i said about Imam Ahmed. Another great Imam, Imam uh, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Our saying which we hold and take as our deen is clinging to the book of Allah, our Lord the, the Almighty and Majestic, and to the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what is reported from the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and the Imams of Hadith. This is what we cling to, and also that to which Abu Abdullah Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, may Allah enlighten his face, raise up his rank and grant him a huge reward. And then he said, and he used to say, distancing, distancing ourselves from those who oppose his sayings, since he was a noble and complete imam by whom Allah made the truth clear and removed the misguidance and made the methodology clear through which Allah annihilated the innovations of the innovators, the deviation of the deviants, and the doubts of the doubters. So may Allah have mercy upon him, the foremost imam. So this is what this great imam, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said about Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed was known, as I said, for being the imam of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, and he dealt with, uh, you know, innovations that came into the religion, that when people tried to bring something new that was not from the Qur'an, not from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that Imam Ahmed was one of those Imams who defended the Sunnah, and he was a muhaddith, meaning he is one of the collection collectors of hadith, and he has a big book called Musnid Imam Ahmed, which is, uh, I'm not sure how many hadiths are in it, but they say about Imam Ahmed that he memorized, I think he memorized uh, a million hadith, I want to say, either a million or a hundred, you know, and may Allah forgive me for, but he, he memorized a great amount of hadith, at least a hundred thousand, if not a million, I, I can't recall, and only some of them, are, of course, are sound, but it shows you how these great imams before us, 
how they uh, adhered to the religion, how they protected the religion. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects Islam through men, through you know those people who memorized the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, protected it and carried it. You know? And so this book here, uh, Asul al Sunnah, is a book which is a book of creed by Imam Ahmed. And before even beginning, uh, that is very important to talk about the importance of, of uh, sitting in gatherings of ilm and seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge, even if it's a little bit, it's very important. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all throughout the Quran, encourages us to seek knowledge encourages us to do righteous deeds and seeking knowledge is one of the highest deeds you can do it's one of the highest deeds you can do and as Sheikh Muhammad mentioned Rahim Allah Ta'ala when he explained Surah Al-Asr where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says Wal Asr inna l-insana lafi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabr Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala swears by the time he says verily mankind is in a lost Except those who have faith and do righteous deeds and are patient or, and do righteous deeds and what uh, to bil haqi what to bil sabr and they call to the haq they call to the truth and they are patient meaning they're patient upon the harms. Imam Muhammad said about this rahimahullah ta'ala he said that that verse the that uh, surah that contains four important components. For one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to have knowledge, or that is evidence for these four things uh, of seeking knowledge, of practicing, of calling to that knowledge, and being patient upon that knowledge. And of course, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, when He makes the exception, He said, Verily, mankind is in a loss. So all of mankind is a loss. Then He said, Illa ladina amanu, except those who believe. Who are those who believe? What does it take to believe? You have to have ilm. You have to have knowledge. And then he said, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمَلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous deeds. Righteous deeds is practicing that knowledge. وَتَوَصُلْ بِالْحَقِّ And calling to the haq, meaning that now after you, you are practicing that knowledge, you share that knowledge. وَتَوَصُلْ بِالْصَبْرِ And while you're sharing that knowledge, you have to be patient upon the harms and the trials you'll face when sharing the knowledge. One of the harms and trials, many of the Imams, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself was, uh, they fought him, they called him crazy, they called him, uh, uh, you know, a magician, they stoned him, you know, they tried to kill him, they poisoned him, all these things befell, this was the, the, the way of the Prophets, and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Ulama Warath uh, Al-Anbiya, that the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. Why? Because they call to the truth and they're going to be tested. They're going to be tested and harmed because of their knowledge and because they're sharing the haq. So there's many ways we can be tested with that, with that knowledge. And you're going to be tested when you're sharing knowledge. And another very important thing we have to be aware of, and so this is just showing the fadl of ilm, and is that whenever you seek knowledge and whenever you do anything in Islam, there are two conditions for that. The first is that you have sincerity to Allah, and the second thing is that you follow the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Everything we do, so for example, when we make Salat, we have to pray to Allah, only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to the grave, not to our grandfather, not to Wali Fulan, not to so and so, no, but we pray only to Allah, so we have sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't pray to show off. And the second condition is that we do it in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet So that means we pray like Muhammad ibn Abdullah وسلم, as he prayed. And so those are the two conditions. So that applies to everything we do. And that applies even to seeking knowledge. That those two conditions must be present. And as evidence for this, the Prophet said in an authentic hadith, the hadith of uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab where he said 
سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما أعمال بنيات وإنما لكل امرئ مناوى فمن كانت حجته إلى الله ورسوله فحجته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت حجته للدنيا يسيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فحجته إلى ما هجر إليه رواه الشيخان In this hadith of Umar bin al-Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه the Amir al-Mu'minin he said that I heard the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say Verily, actions are tied to the intentions, and everyone will get that for which he intended. Therefore, he who migrates for Allah and His Messenger, then he has migrated for Allah and His Messenger. And he who migrates to, for some worldly gain or to take some woman in marriage, then he will get that for which he migrated. Meaning, one of the benefits of this hadith, and the a'adham, most important benefit, is it shows us the importance of sincerity, and that our actions in Islam they must be put on the scale of ikhlas, meaning, did you do it for Allah? When you prayed, did you pray to Allah and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you, the person who goes out for jihad, fi sabidillah, was it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The one who seeks knowledge, was it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The one who shares knowledge, was it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All of those things, you have to look at the sincerity. Okay, and that's the way we measure whether you're going to be rewarded or whether it's a punishment. Because that sincerity can get you either, if it's for Allah, it can get you to the highest level of paradise. But if it's for someone in the creation, you do it to show off, it could get you in, in the hellfire. And even the worst part of the hellfire. And one evidence for this is a very important hadith, and I'll mention this before we get into the book. It's a very important hadith, the hadith of Abi Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, in the awal al-nas yukda alayhi yawm al-qiyamah, rajal al-ustushida, fa'utiya bi fa'arafuhu ni'amu fa'arafaha, fa'qala fa'ma'u ma'alta fiha, qala qatalsu fika hatta ustushid, qala kithabd, wa lakinnaka fa'alta liyukal, huwa, huwa jari, faqad kiltu ma'umira bihi fa'suhib ala wajihi, so in this hadith of Abi Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, amongst the first three people on the day of judgment to be judged, is the first one is the person who was a martyr. And he will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asked, so what did you do? And then he will say, I fought for your sake. And then I was martyred. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Kithab, you lied. But rather you did it so that the people would say you were a great martyr, a great mujahid. And it was said. So then he will be dragged into the hellfire. So that shows that that person, because of his intention, he was doing one of the greatest things you could do in Islam, which is to be martyred for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, in the right way. But he did it so that the people would say that so-and-so was a martyr, so-and-so was a mujahid, so-and-so was this. And he got that reward in the dunya, the people said about him that. But in the hereafter, he lost the reward of that and he was dragged in the hellfire for that same deed. That deed it could either get you to paradise or it could get you to the hellfire. Then the second person that, that was mentioned, وَرَجِلٌ تَعَلَّمَ الْعِلْمُ وَعَلَّمَهُ وَقَرَى فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ قال فما عملت فيها قال تعلمت العلم وعلمتها وعلمته وقرأت فيك القرآن قال كذبت ولكنك فعلت لي قال هو عالمون وقرأت لي لي قال هو عالمون فقد كيل ثم أمر به في صحيب الوجه ثم ألقي في النار أو حتى ألقي في النار. So the second person who will be brought on the day of judgment is a person who had a lot of knowledge and. He was considered a scholar, and or uh, also the person who was a re great reciter of the Quran. He memorized the Quran and he recited and he taught the people. Beautiful recitation, and he's brought before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And Allah will say, "What did you do for for me?" And he will say, "I learned knowledge, I sought knowledge, and I taught the people for your sake. And I read the Quran, had a beautiful re recitation for your sake, and taught the people." And Allah will say you lied, but rather you did it so that the people would say you were a knowledgeable person. And you did it so the people would say you were a beautiful reciter. And it was said about you. So he's dragged in the hellfire on his face. And the third person, 
وسعل عليه وأعطاه من أسناف المال كله فأتي به فعرفه النعم فعرفها قال فما عملت فيها قال ما تركت من سبيل أن تنفق فيها إلا أنفقت فيها اللق قال كذبت ولكنك فعلت اللي قال هو جواد فقد كيل ثم أمر به فسحب على وجهه so the third person who's brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment is the man who had a lot of wealth and he spent it in many many ways at least this is what we thought he built a masjid he built maraqis a sunnah so the people would learn Islam you could you know built places of charity built you know gave to the poor did all these because he said I didn't leave a single path of goodness except that I spent in that path for your sake. And then Allah will say to him, you lied. But rather you did it so that the people would say you were a spendthrift. And it was said about you. So then he will be dragged on his face in the hellfire and thrown in the hellfire. The shahid or the point of this hadith of the Prophet wasallam is to show us the importance of sincerity to Allah that whatever we do related to worship and Islam do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you go to the masjid it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're learning it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as I've mentioned on countless times the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whoever strives to learn knowledge, Islamic knowledge, then Allah will make easy for him the path of Jannah. Letting us know, as the Salaf, the early scholars used to say, they said, Talib al-ilm is Talib al-Jannah. Seeking knowledge is seeking paradise. That's really what a Talib al-ilm is. The Talib al-ilm is not the one he memorizes a lot, he, he reads and he teaches the people, he's popular, big lectures, YouTube, this, Big halls, thousands of people. That's not Talib al-Ilm. The Talib al-Ilm is the one who in his heart he's seeking paradise by that knowledge. And even if one person is listening, but he's doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is Talib al-Ilm because he's Talib al-Jannah. He's seeking paradise. He or she is seeking paradise. Because Talib al-Ilm could be, as, as the Prophet sallallahu said in another hadith, Talib al-Ilm fariditun ala kulli muslima, or kulli muslim wa muslima. This is Sahih hadith. The Prophet sallallahu said, seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim and Muslimah. Meaning that we have to know about the basics of our religion. We need to know about Aqidah, how to pray, how to fast properly. We have to know that knowledge. Every Muslim needs to know that knowledge. So the point is, is that by seeking knowledge and disseminating knowledge, this is the path to Jannah, if a person is doing it with sincerity. And right now, us sitting here, even this little gathering here, if our intention is to please Allah, then we'll be rewarded for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward it. Allah, maybe Allah will forgive us of some sins. Maybe. Bi'idnillah. So that, that was the, the, the shahid in the beginning of the treaties. One of the mashayikh, one of our mashayikh, Sheikh uh, Abdulaziz, uh, Sheikh Abdulaziz ibn Abdullah al-Rajihi. He's one of the mashayikh in, in Riyadh. Half of Allah ta'ala. Uh, big scholar in Riyadh. And those are some of the benefits he mentioned in the beginning of this book. Now I want to get into some of the text itself and some of the importance uh, related to this book and and if you want to know about Imam Ahmed then you know this l lecture or this uh, study concise study of this book is not about we're not going to go into depth about who Imam Ahmed was you know and he was a great Imam of the Sunnah but if you read you will find out how what how he sacrificed for Islam he was tortured in prison beaten strictly because he would not compromise related to his deen and he would say that the Quran was not created because during the time of Imam Ahmed he was tested that a lot of the Ummah believed and this bid'ah came into the Ummah or an innovation where the people said the Quran was created and even the leader believed this and was forcing Imam Ahmed and they wanted him to recant but he didn't recant and due to his not changing his position and saying no the Quran is the speech of Allah the Quran is the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he did not compromise, this is the reason we have a lot of comfort now. And today. yeah, and we're here today with the, the correct aqidah. Because these great imams, they sacrificed. And that's what Islam requires for us, to sacrifice. Bi'idnillah ta'ala. So, 
in the beginning of the treaties, the treaties, I'm going to read a little bit of how the treaties, uh, the treaty was uh, transmitted because there's a, a very important point here, and, and, and I'll explain it as we go, um, that you'll find the early books uh, in all the Islamic sciences, whether it's hadith, whether it's fiqh, whether it's, uh, you know, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu they were transmitted by narrators, meaning there's people they memorized and they wrote down and they transmitted it to someone else. To the, they got it from their sheikh, who got it from their sheikh, who got it from maybe one of the students of the students of the Sahaba, who got it from one of the students of the Sahaba, who got it to the, from a Sahab, from a Sahabi. So this is how knowledge has been was transmitted, especially uh, the first you know so many hundreds of years in Islam. But now we have a lot of books, and a lot of times when we study, we don't hear the narrators. We don't know who narrated the hadith. We just hear Qala Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We just hear the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. But just so that we know that knowledge was transmitted in Islam through people memorizing and preserving that knowledge, the narrators, and they had to be trustworthy people to carry this knowledge. So, uh, in the beginning of the book, قال Imam al qai رحمه الله تعالى قال أخبرنا علي ابن محمد بن عبد الله السكري قال حدثنا عثمان بن أحمد بن سماك قال حدثنا أبو محمد أبو محمد الحسن الحسن بن عبد عبد الوهاب بن أبي أنبري قراءة عليه من كتابه في شهر ربيع الأول من سنة ثلاث ثلاث وتسعين ومئتين. So these were some of the narrators of this book that they heard it from their sheikh, who heard it from their sheikh, who heard it from their sheikh, and then he said, and it was given to him in the year um, two hundred and ninety-three Hijri. So this book we have before us. The writer of this book died over 1,200 years ago. This book is over 1,200 years old that we're about to look into. So it just goes to show you how knowledge and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves the knowledge of Islam. Unlike the other religions like Christians and Jews, they don't have the same authenticity that they can rely on. And this is one of the things that distinguishes Islam from the other faiths is because of the narrators because of the chain of narration and so that's the only reason that I mention those narrators just to give us an idea how this religion was uh, passed on then there was other narrators قال حدثنا أبو جعفر محمد بن سليمان المنقري البصري قال حدثني عبدوس بن مالك الأطار قال سمعت أبا عبد الله أحمد بن محمد بن هنبو رحمه الله تعالى so this narration all the way to Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Yaqul. So Imam Ahmed said, Usul al Sunnati indana tamasiku bi ma kana alayhi ashaba rusulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa iqtida ubihim wa tarkal bida wa kulu bida tin fihi dalala wa tarkal khusumat wa jalus ma ashab al ahwa wa tarkal mira wa jilal wa khusumat fi deen. So Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the one, the book that we're studying, Usul al Sunnah. He said, Usul al-Sunnah indana, meaning the foundation of the Sunnah to us, meaning these great Imams of the Sunnah who, who preserved this religion over a thousand years ago. He said, the, the, the foundation of the Sunnah to us is adhering to what the companions of, Moh of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam were upon and adhering to it steadfast and leaving innovation, religious innovation, newly matters that come into the religion. And every innovation is misguidance and leaving argument, argumentation and debating and sitting with the people of desires and leaving uh, argumentation, controversy and uh, debating regarding the religion. And so now we're going to explain this from what the ulama say, because this is very, very important to, to understand. So the first thing he said, Usula Sunnah Indana, that the Sunnah, the Prophet, uh, the foundation of the Sunnah to us is that you adhere to what the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad were upon. 
some important points with this is first and foremost uh, is that if you want first uh, our Shaykh Shaykh Ubaid al-Jabri rahimahullah uh, hafizahullah ta'ala he said this uh, treatise you know that was transmitted from Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala and you know, form, formulates the methodology of the Salaf of this Ummah, the Minhaj of the Salaf of this Ummah, and the foundation of the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. And this is what the Salaf, the Salaf meaning the first three generations, this means the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the students of the Sahaba, and the Itba'a Tabi'een, the, their students. This is what they were upon. This is their, what they believed regarding creed, regarding manners regarding all of these things in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet This is what they believe, this is how they, they believe So, uh, and, and this is the point also of why I mentioned those narrators because one of the great Imams, one of the great Tabi'een his name was Abdullah ibn Mubarak Rahimahullah Ta'ala so he was a, he met Sahaba or, or he might have been Itba'a Tabi'een, Abdullah bin Mubarak, I can't recall. But he either met Sahaba or he, was, uh, he met the students of the Sahaba. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. Imam Abdullah, uh, Abdullah bin Mubarak, great mujahid, he said, Al-Isnad min ad-deen. Lo la l-isnad laqal ma sha ma sha. So Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, and this is why I mentioned those those narration, or you know, gave you the chain of narration that so and so said, so and so 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 and so said, because uh, Abdullah bin Mubarak he said, and this was he was in the time just right around the time of the Sahaba, so not that far after the death of the Prophet sallallahu you know, uh, perhaps a hundred, you know, within a hundred year span. And he said, the chain of narra- narration is the deen, it is the religion. And he said, because if we didn't have the chain of narr- narration, then the people would say, anyone would say whatever he wanted to say. Meaning, because there would be no way to check it. Someone could say, oh, this is a hadith of the Prophet. Because during, after the Prophet ﷺ died, there was many people who came around, some people that made mistakes, some people who just uh, directly lied and said things about the Prophet ﷺ, and especially as time went on. So that's why during the time of the Sahaba, they didn't have to ask, who did you hear, hear it from? Because the Sahaba, if it was from a Sahabi, they're all considered what they're called adul, meaning they're all trustworthy. All the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ are trustworthy. So you don't have to have any doubt about the Sahaba. But after the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, then they had to begin to ask, who did you hear that from? Because some people began to lie about the Prophet Sallallahu make up hadith. Say, and some people began to make hadith according to their, me, uh, their madhab and their understanding of Islam to support their creed, their innovative creed. So people began to make up so for their own desires and their own benefit. So that's why they began to ask, you know, who are, who are your narrators? Who are the people who are narrating so we can check to see if they're authentic, if they are Sahih narrators. And so that's why the Isnad became the religion, meaning that the Isnad is how the religion was preserved by asking about so-and-so and and -and so-and-so and so-and-so who are known narrators and who knew uh, Sahaba and and what have you. (laughs) Radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'in. Related to the term Asul, as this book is called Asul al-Sunnah, Asul refers to like the foundation, like they say the usul of a tree. The usul of a tree is what? What's the foundation of a tree? The roots, exactly. So that's the usul in the in the in the language. And in Arabic, they talk about the usul. So they the the many of the mashayikh when they explain this book, they talk about what usul means in the Arabic language. So it refers to the foundation. If we want to talk about the usul of this apartment, we have to go to the foundation of the apartment, the concrete. What's in the concrete? There's rebar. What's in, you know, what, what makes up the concrete? Cement, rocks, and water. So this is the asul of this, this, um, this building. So likewise, there's an asul in Islam, and there's an asul of the sunnah of the Prophet or the asul of the sunnah. And this is Imam Ahmed, 
uh, he named his treaties Asula Sunnah for this reason, to show that these are general foundations that the Muslims should know and understand regarding their religion and regarding what makes the person rightfully to be called from Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Okay, so this is this is that foundation, and another meaning of the Sunnah, and perhaps this is less important for us, so we won't go, uh, uh, not the Sunnah, but uh, of the Sul. Maybe outside. Uh, so here we'll go. We'll go right to the point. The Sheikh Sheikh Ubaid Jabri Hafidullah Taala. He said, "Will Murad be Asul Sunnah?" So he said, "What is meant by Asul Sunnah here in this book? You know the meaning that Imam Ahmed is giving it. He ma yajibu itimad alehi min al qawaid fil ibadah wal aqidah wa muamalat. He said that it is what is an obligation to believe from the principles of the religion of Islam regarding worship." Regarding your aqidah or your creed, you know your belief, and regarding your mu'amalat on how you deal with one another, whether it be marriage, divorce, whether it be uh, if there is a, a punishment, it, or whether it be you know all the the different mu'amalat, whether it be buying and selling, all of that is considered mu'amalat. It's it's transactions, business transactions, and social transactions. So. What is meant here by Asul Sunnah, it means the general principles pertinent to uh, your, that you must believe in regarding your worship, regarding your creed, and regarding how you interact with one another. And then the Sheikh said that this Asul, or this foundation that Imam Ahmed uh, has put forth, that these principles we rely on and they are uh, derived from the Nusus, meaning the Qur'an and the uh, Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Seerah of the Salaf of this Ummah, meaning the, the, the biographies of the early generations, meaning the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, with Tabi'at Tabi'een. So this is the principles and it comes from their belief, their way of giving da'wah, their um, um, you know, interactions and their creed, very important creed. This is a book, a very important book of creed, this book is. Creed, and if you want to say menhaj or methodology as well. Methodology of how to understand Islam. And in relation to that, we'll try to be as brief as possible, so not, not to be so long. Uh, we'll just mention one important benefit and the in in relation to the first thing which Imam Ahmed said, so he said Asul Sunnah Indana, you know, and he said adhering to the Sahaba, you know, adhering to what the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, what they were upon. This comes from a hadith of the Prophet. The Prophet Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi said if tarakatil Yahud ala ifta was a bain firka. If tarakatil Nasara ala ifna tain was a bain firka. With the tariku had he umala thalatha was a bain firka, kulaha fin nara la wahada. Kulna men here ya rasulullah. Kala men can ala mithi uma can ali was habi alium. Or kema kala nebi salai salam. So the Prophet salai salam said, the Jews would break into 71 sects. The Christians would break into 72 sects. And my umma, meaning us, would break into 73 sects. All of them in the hellfire, except one. Then his companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, they asked, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? And then the Prophet sallallahu said, those are upon what, my, what I'm upon and what my companions are upon. And that shows us that qaida, that important rule. That's that first important foundation, is that we love the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, they were all just. They were all trustworthy. They were the best of this nation. We believe that as a point of our creed. And we try to strive to understand Islam with how they understood the Quran and how they understood the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because Allah spoke about them in the Quran and praised them. Allah promised uh, them Jannah. They also, they were favored to be the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They also 
were the ones who transmitted this religion. They were the ones uh, who strove, they fought jihad fi sabilillah, they memorized the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu even in hunger and difficulties and trials, and they preserved the sunnah and they passed it on to their students, who passed it on to their students, who passed it on all the way up until our time now. And, they, and so they were the ones to help preserve the Qur'an. You know, they the ones, they, they collected the Qur'an, compiled the Qur'an, and put it in, so it would be in a mushaf, in a, in a book form like this. You know, because it, before it was revelation that they memorized, and you'd find some of it written on bones, and written on uh, leaves, and whatever they could find it. And, 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 of course, those who memorized it. But in order to keep it preserved, then they wrote it in the mushaf. They wrote it in the mushaf. But the Qur'an itself is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine speech of Allah. It's perfect, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves it in Allah al-Mahfuz. So I think that it's sufficient now because we don't want to uh, fall asleep or, or, or anything, but inshallah we'll, we'll continue our study another time and we'll, we'll continue on step by step. Uh, in order to gain benefit and hopefully get through this book because it's an incredibly important book or at least as much as we can bi'idhnillah ta'ala and I ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil anything I said that was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with ilm nafi wa ruskin tayyib wa amal al-mutaqabilin and may Allah tabarak wa ta'ala bless us to be in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam